Welcome to the Connecting Point. A lot of hoopla going on this weekend with football games going on. A lot of people wishing they had tickets to those games. A lot of people wishing their tickets were on the 50-yard line or maybe in the end zone or the student section. Maybe if you're like me, you wish it was by the band somewhere in the corner with all the crazy nuts. But one thing when you get to the gate, if you want to walk in, you got to have a ticket. Amen? Got to have one. All the want to sit outside. All the wish is outside. The only people that get in are the ones with the ticket. And I don't know what it is you're looking forward to about heaven. But let me tell you, it'll be there and more. The Bible teaches us that it's not even entered into our mind. Not the half has been told. It's not even dreamed of in our crazy, wild imaginations what God has in store for those who love him, those who are seeking after his return, the day that he'll return. But I'll remind you, you've got to have a ticket. I can't give it to you. And I can't buy it for you. And you certainly can't earn it. But this is the best part. I think maybe we should just text it out because people would believe it if it was a text. Put it on Facebook, people would believe it, but because you preach it, people don't. It's free. Amen? Available to all. Could you imagine? Can you imagine if you were one of those guys that stands on the corner and holds up tickets for people that you said, free! You'd be a memory of a guy standing on the corner. <laughs> right? Right? Here I have the greatest offer ever. Eternal glory presence of the Almighty, to sit at the feet of the creator of the universe. I love to sit and let my grandma and grandpa and my mama and papa listen to them tell stories. Their finite minds are amazing. Their temporal bodies were, were cool, but how will it be to sit at the feet of Jesus and have him recount the making of the mountains and the filling of the sea? the creating of the light, the separation of the darkness. What will it be like to sit with him when he recounts that even though David blew it, he still loved him? Even though Peter denied him, it just made Jesus love him more. What will it be like for him to tell me why it was that he climbed that hill and laid down on my cross and took on my sin and died for me? It will take a, an infinite mind and a perfected body to even begin to hold on to the greatness of all that God has done for me. The Bible says that no man has seen God at any time because if you were to see God, your spirit would leave your body. And, and sometimes people think that that means if you see God, God kills you or punishes you, and that is so the wrong picture. It's sort of like those advertisements, you know, for the food. They never show it cold and left over. They show it warm and steamy, right? And you say, I want that right now. When you see God, when you see who he is and his beauty and his wonder and his splendor, your earth suit is not able to contain your spirit. Your spirit doesn't say, oh, I can't wait for that. Your spirit says, I'm not going to wait for that. Boom, you leave it. Your old body, that old earth suit, falls to the ground. And you go home with Jesus. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and Enoch was no more because he was translated. What a bizarre King James word to use. But it's so accurate. He was changed from a language that we understand to one that we don't. Old preachers have always said they just... We're walking together and got closer to God's house than Enoch's house, and Enoch just went on home with him. Amen? What will it be like to stand at the, in the presence of the Almighty, to fall on your face before him, and try to figure out how you're going to say thank you for all that God has done? Thanks for not quitting on me. Thanks for not giving up. Thanks for not doing what any logical being would have done. You should have quit on me long ago. You should have tired of me blowing it 
time after time after time. You should have been embarrassed of my sin. You should have been ashamed of my unwillingness to surrender. God, you should have quit to have him explain what I could never explain to you. That his love eclipses all. He says, where you see fault, I see my child. Amen? Where you see pain and sorrow, I see potential joy. Where you see your weakness, I see my strength. Where you see the cracks in your armor, I see my armor encasing you. Where you see failure, I see lessons learned. When your head is down because you've been defeated, that's exactly the right place for prayer. I can't explain it to you. I don't have the ability to craft in earthly words what only God can be. But I can arrange a meeting where the infinite God can spend all of eternity showing you, not telling you, but showing you that great love. Amen? But you got to have a ticket. I didn't pay for it, but I can hand them out all day long. Amen? i got a fistful of them for anybody that wants them. It's not about this church. It's not about religion. It's about one simple thing. Are you alive in Christ? Or are you still dead in your sins? There's a TV show called The Walking Dead, and unfortunately that phrase has now been hijacked. But it's a much more apt term to describe those of us who think that somehow our sinful lives are ever going to get rid of our sinful lives. When I was a kid, I was asked to wash my dad's car, and, and, uh, and I was so excited about that, as you can imagine. So I rushed right out there and did that. And the car needed to be washed, and so I got a towel, and I went out there and squirted the car down, and I soaped it up, and I took that, that towel, and I washed and scrubbed and got all the grime and dirt, and then I, I cleaned off the, the rims, you know, and got all the brake dust off the rims, so you could imagine about what that towel looked like. And then I sprayed it off, and then I went to dry it with that very same towel. That's about what it's like for you to fix your own sin. You can't use a dirty towel to clean a car. Do you understand? You, all I did was I took the dirt and, and, and aggregated it into that one uh, towel, and then I spread it all back evenly across the car. You know, I didn't want it to be anything missed. I wanted to make sure it, it got even. That's about what it is for me to try and get rid of my sin and my, he'll hang it in air quotes, righteousness. I need a power outside of me. Amen? I need a promise that isn't grounded in me. I need a promise that isn't grounded on this earth or in this time. I need a promise that is bigger and greater and grander than anything I could ever do, anything I could ever attain on my own. If you have your Bibles open to the book of Galatians, chapter number 3 and verse number 15. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 15. My son was amused the other day because there was an ad that came on talking about how Michelle Nunn was the only hope for the region that she represents and how this 30-second ad just went on about how she was going to solve our problems and was the right person. Literally, the very next ad was 30 seconds talking about how Michelle Nunn is the worst problem that could ever happen and the worst solution. I'm, I'm, I'm not for or against her. I'm for Jesus, and that's all I know. But I'm just saying, it's funny that he was laughing because here's 30 seconds thinking, my goodness, here's the best thing ever, and 30 seconds saying, this would be the end of America. I can't tell you how many times on a Sunday afternoon if you tune in to uh, certain radio stations, you'll hear 30 minutes of the best preaching you've ever heard about the Bible and the truth and the principles of God, followed by 30 minutes of all the lies and, and ridiculousness and prosperity doctrine you could ever imagine. Same radio station, same tune in, everything. Same quote-unquote preachers uh, preaching and churches churching and all the stuff that they do. And lo and behold, the message is the opposite. I don't know if you're like me, but I get a little bit sick of being promised everything 
and delivered nothing. I had an exciting conversation with the warrants and warranty people this week who said to me nine times while we're on the phone, Mr. Franklin, I am so sorry that you're having this trouble, but we will get it taken care of. And I said to this kind person, I said, I appreciate your words, but you can understand how meaningless they are to me since you are, in fact, the 24th person on this same line who has promised that you are both sorry for my trouble and going to take care of my issue. Right? Do you know what, what it is? It's just an empty promise. I'll get there. I'll make it. I had a fellow coming out to... I, I felt I, I'm, I, have, I have money that I want to give this person if they'll just show up. Just show up. That's if you could just show up, I want to put this money in your hand. I'll be there Thursday. Not there Thursday. I'll be there Friday. First thing Friday. Not there Friday. Friday, I'll be there Friday afternoon. I'll be there for you. Friday. I, I left Friday night. I said, I just, I'm going to give up. I promise. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. I promise. I'm going to make it. Don't you worry. I'm tired of politicians getting elected on lies and things that they're going to promise to get done when no sentient, reasonable person would ever believe that anyone could evoke or create that kind of change in their term. Don't make promises that you're going to fix America. Make a promise that you're going to represent your people. Amen? And if they say yay, then I say yay. And if they say nay, then I say nay. That's, that's the only promise I'm looking for. We just sang and celebrated the promise of salvation. And if, and if that promise is found in, in Kate, then we're in trouble. If that promise is found in David, then we're in trouble. If that promise is grounded in me, then we're in trouble. If that promise is grounded on the foundations of this building, then we're in trouble. Amen? Church buildings, the earthquakes happen and fires burn down and, and the typhoons and hurricanes and tornadoes can tear it down. Nothing is permanent that we build. Amen? Kate's not singing about her promise. She's sharing with you the eternal promise. And she's able to sing it and shout it and cry about it. Because that promise isn't found in her me or in this building or in this place but it's seated in the heavens it's founded upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ amen Galatians chapter 3 the changeless promise brethren I speak in the manner of men though it is only a man's covenant yet if it is confirmed no one annuls or adds to it now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, God does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to your seed who is Christ. And this I say that the law which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ. That it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Do what? God said to Abraham, To you and your seed, I make this promise. And 430 years of man made law? And all the religious people with all their fancy robes and pretty houses trying to make it uh, exactly what humans can make it into cannot break it. 430 years of organized religion couldn't undo the promise that God made to Abraham. Because that promise to Abraham wasn't about his children. It was about Messiah. It was about Yeshua. It was about the promise of the Almighty coming flesh and dwelling among us. It was a promise of a Redeemer. And that Redeemer is found in Jesus Christ. And when Christ came in the scene, all of the religion was annulled. And Abraham's promise was confirmed. This changeless promise isn't a promise founded upon my words or our religion. We are so consumed in churches with bylaws. 
We have a procedure for everything. The only reason we have procedures, just so you know this, is because somebody somewhere got away with something that we didn't like. So we made a rule to make sure they can't do that again. Well, we must have a quorum before we can make a vote. Okay, awesome. What's a quorum? I think a quorum is when you have enough people. No, we have to decide. It's a, it's a five-eighths quorum. It's a five-sevenths quorum quorum. Great. How many members are there in this church? Not how many people come here. How many members are there? Probably 10,000. 8,000 of them have been dead for 100 years, but that's all right. I don't believe that any Baptist church or any Methodist church in the South is ever going to have a quorum because it's a percentage of the membership. And since 80% of the people on the roll are dead... That's either going to be the most uncomfortable business meeting ever or you're not going to have a quorum. We've got to have a quorum before we can decide the business. You know what we really need? You want to know Mike's rule? Randomly have a business meeting on Wednesday night without telling anyone. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a, well, that just hurts my feelings. Good. What if I'm not there? Ha. Ah. Now you see the genius of my plan. Well, I might protest. Again, just have it randomly on a Wednesday night. You want to know why? Because the people that are there on Wednesday night are the ones that right now are back there watching all the kids. They're the ones out there guarding the parking lot. They're the ones that were in here this morning changing out light bulbs and knocking down cobwebs. The people that are there on Wednesday night, if you don't announce a business meeting, are the glue of your church. That's who should get the vote. Well, exactly. You are saying amen to me even if you don't believe it. Well, we have to announce it two weeks ahead of time. Why do you need two weeks notice? Do you want to know why? So you can call all of your relatives that never come to church to come and sit beside you so they can, if you raise your hand, they raise, I saw one time there were 30 people I'd never seen before in a church business meeting and the guy sneezed and they all sneezed. Papa said, whatever he did, we did. Amen? I wonder why churches are so messed up. Because we allow the humans to be in charge of them. The least qualified of all the people in this sanctuary today, of all the entities and beings inside of this room, we put us in charge? We believe this is God's house. And why doesn't he get a vote? Amen? I'm just going to throw it out there. Maybe if this is God's house and we're God's people, then perhaps we should entertain the thought that God gets a say in the matter. Well, he might change things. This <laughs> God never changes. We require constant change. And so even though God might create change in our lives, guess what he's not doing? He's not changing. So if we say we're going to get in line with God and we're the ones who has to move, guess who blinked? It wasn't God. He was over here. Over here. You want to get right with me? Okay, I'm right where I was when y'all left me. I'm right where I was. When you wandered away, there was a man named Abram who was just okay at following God. And I know we always admire Abram for being this man of faith and God said go and he went and I think that's awesome. But that's a little bit like me. I'm the guy who's like, God says go and I go and I, don't forget, to, I forget to pack a lunch. Do you know what I'm saying? And I get hungry later and I say, God, where's the food? He said it was at your house. Why didn't you bring it? You know what I mean? Abram said, hey, I'm hungry. There's no food here. Go to Egypt. God didn't say to go to Egypt. God said, I want you to stay right here. Abraham was at a place called Bethel. What does Bethel mean? House of God. He was at a place called, are you, are you, are you keeping up with me? You want notes? He was at a place called the house of God. 
He had built it because God said, build it. And God said, call it Bethel. Let me make it clear. God said, build the house. We're going to call it the house of God. You keeping up with me, Skippy? There we go. Right? House of God. And so he's right there. I just got in a Tim Hawkins moment. I'm sorry. He was right there in the presence of God, in the house of God, with God. And he said, I'm hungry. Let's go down yonder and get some vittles. May not be exactly what he said. He probably spoke it in Hebrew, but it's pretty much the same thing. And he found himself in a foreign land getting schooled and preached to by a secular king because he lied about his sister wife. I just think it's funny that Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. Right? Oh, things are terrible now. No, they're not. No, they're just less hidden. We didn't invent any of this sin. We just don't, we just have lost the ability to be ashamed of our sin. But I assure you, we didn't invent it. We're not doing anything that hadn't been done before. In fact, I, I hate to break it to you, as those of you who think we're as bad as it can get, we're not. In the oldest parts of the Old Testament, there's a god, Molech. And Molech required that you send your children through the fire. You think we're pretty bad off now? How far would you get when you said, I'd do anything for prosperity, including sacrificing my own children? No, we didn't invent depravity, folks. We just are less ashamed of it than we used to be. We used to have some common sense about it. Abram went down there because God needed his help. God said he was going to take care of Abram and his family. But God needed his help, right? Isn't that, isn't that true, all y'all? Nod with me if you know you're wrong. Because, I mean, God's, I mean, he's big and he's, he's mighty, he's eternal. And I'm trusting my entire eternity to him, but he probably needs my help right now because he's busy. And, and he probably means like, hey, listen, here's your instructions. Just do the best you can. And if you get in trouble, press the red button. You think that's what God means? No. No, my Bible says those who wait upon the Lord. I, I'm good at some things. Waiting is not on that list. I'm the guy who waits like this. That's me waiting. Is it time yet? No? Okay. How about now? Is it now? No. Okay. Okay. How about now? Now? Ready? Are we ready? Are we ready? That's me. My Bible says those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Amen? I've never seen anyone rewarded in the scripture for wandering away from God to do it on their own. He's at a place called Bethel. He wanders off, lies about his wife, almost creates a horrible situation, and has a secular, non-believing king lecture him about living for God. How far are you when the world is lecturing you about being a good person? Yikes. Amen? Yikes. Abram repented, and guess where he went next? The Bible says he returned to Bethel. Would anyone like to know who was waiting for him when he got there? God never changes. We might have to change to be more like him, but he never changes. Hey, I know, Abram, I know, I know it's hard. I spoke to you and said to build a house here. And I asked you to call it the house of God. And I met with you in this place. 
and you wandered off and wondered where I had gone. And when you came back to the place called the house of God, hey, there you are. Amen. Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son. If the dad is so anxious for his son's return, have you ever asked a really challenging question? Why didn't he go get him? I mean, if you're that anxious for your son to return, why don't you just go get him? Why not? I mean, if you're standing there, the, the indication from the story that Jesus tells us is that this, this father stood at the edge of his property and, 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 if you will, if I can put it in southernism, on the edge of the front porch and peered off down the dirt road hoping his son would return. Why not go get him? Why not? Why didn't, why didn't God scurry after Abram? The answer is the same as why God put a tree in the Garden of Eden and said, don't touch it. Because when there's no choice, there's no way to obey. It's not obedience. And if that father had gone and kidnapped that son, that son's rebellious spirit would have exploded and he would have destroyed not only himself, but his whole family. And as much as it breaks that father's heart, he had to wait on that son's mind to change. Where is God in all of this? Standing right where you left him. Amen? Standing right where you left him. Prodigals are a mystery. They are the pain point inside of every good church. People who believe in God and surrender to God ask themselves the same question, why do prodigals wander off? Why, when they're so blessed, when they're given so much, why do they wander off? Why can't they be content in the grace that God has given them? And the answer is because our flesh shouts, but God whispers. And we turn up the volume of the world to pump and thump and crank and rock and roll and we hear it so loudly and we bathe ourselves in it so much but we can't hear the still, constant voice of God calling us home. Well, Pastor, I just, I just I've been trying. I, I can't hear from God. When were you trying? Were you trying while you were watching on average 22 hours of television a week? Is that when you were trying? Were you trying to hear from God while you're watching a movie that you better not tell your children you went to see? Or that television show that you shouldn't like but you do anyway because it's, you know, it's funny? Or was it when you're listening to the music that glorified the world instead of glorifying God? I'm not against any of that stuff. I'm just explaining the irony of standing in Bethel, the house of God, with God, and wandering off in search of God. Oh, this is a great mystery. I went to church one time, and the Holy Spirit pressed on my heart so that I surrendered and gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ. And now that I'm hurting and worried and afraid and alone and I don't know what to do, I just wonder where I should go. Let me connect the dots. The house of God. Amen? Now, am I saying that this particular building is the only house of God. Not even close. 
In fact, I'm sort of putting a burden on us to make sure that when those folks do come back, guess who's still here? God. Now, this is going to this is going to hurt some of y'all's feelings, so just go ahead and get your tissue out. But that means that our greeting has to be in the name of Jesus. And our connect groups have to be in the name of Jesus. And our handshakes have to be in the name of Jesus. And our music has to be in the name of Jesus. And our singing and our praise and our worship in the name of Jesus. And our prayers in the name of Jesus. And our offering of tithes in the name of Jesus. And yes, absolutely, beyond any shadow of a doubt, every word that's preached and taught has to be the word of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Lest the prodigal come home and find that the father had moved. I try my best not to add fiction inside of Scripture, but I do pray for godly insight. When that prodigal son returned, the opulence and wealth of the father is clear. Do you agree with that? He put a new ring, he, he slaughtered the fatted calf, he put new robes on him. There was this opulence of servants and, and all that was going. You understand what I'm saying? Do you know what happens when most of us start making a little more money? We get a little nicer house. And then we work hard and we make a little more money, and guess what we do? We get a little nicer house. Now, I'm not trying to add fiction on top of Scripture. I'm just trying to make a point, so hang with me. Guess who didn't move? Father. That old farmhouse was fine with him because he wanted his boy. If he came back, he wanted to know where he was. Amen? Amen? My son Dylan might be developing a complex. We sent him off to camp last week. He worked at camp for eight weeks down in Florida, and we moved to Georgia. We sent him off to camp this year for nine weeks, and we moved into a new house. I suppose the fact that we keep telling him where it is maybe helps him to feel, you know... But it really, and it, it's not hard. After three or four days of hard prayer, my wife and I did decide to tell him. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> no, no, he's, y'all, y'all must understand. He's back there going, thank you, Jesus. That means we moved twice and he didn't have to help a stitch. Right, that's, thank you for your willingness to serve, Dylan. But if that's how you feel, there's some people that are moving soon, and they could probably use some help, so. In, in my personal belief, the father didn't, well, I know he didn't move, but my belief is that he didn't move even though he could have. Okay, because he, he said, I want to be at the same address when that boy comes home. And I don't know how many days he went out there and looked down the road for his boy to return. But the Bible didn't say like he had a strange notion and went and looked. The way it reads to me in Jesus' words is that that was his ritual. And in fact, he may have stood at that porch, and I know porch isn't a biblical term, but y'all hang with me. He may have stood on the front of the house at that point and looked down the road and prayed for that boy. Can Can I just take an aside? Is it okay if we have a free sermon in the middle of this one? Can I just tell you what it must have been like to be sitting there praying? Oh, Lord, bring him home. Lord, bring him home. Lord, bring him home. How I long to see his face coming down that road. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says he ran to him and fell on his neck, and he kissed him. My son is home at last. And let me remind you that the one telling that story is El. It is God. It is Jesus saying, I am standing right where you left me, and I am praying for all my prodigals to come home. 
And when you return, you will find me right where you left me. I am so tired of fake, empty promises. Do you know what I'd like for you to say? Just say, I'm going to try my best. And if you mess up, just say, I'm sorry, I did try. That's fine with me. I don't expect perfection. I go to restaurants sometimes and the, the waiter or the waitress tries to remember my order and I try to explain to them that doesn't impress me. If you want to impress me, get my order right. Amen? I don't need you to remember it. Scribble it down. Send a smoke signal. Send a telegram. I don't care. But when it comes out and we said, please no ketchup anywhere on it or my daughter will go into epileptic seizures. Please don't put ketchup on it. Oh, did we get that wrong? Yes, yeah, shockingly. Since you didn't write it down. They say to me, I promise I'll remember. I'm just not that concerned. I don't need you. I'm not impressed. Your tip is not predicated on you remembering it. It's predicated on getting it right. We don't need to promise what we can't deliver. Some of you asked me to come to the hospital and visit you. You're going to hear me say, I will do my best. Lord willing. Because I'm going to tell you, there are times when I'm on my way. And someone calls, and they're in a mess. And I'm going to remind everybody here at all times, I have only one master. And I have to do what God asked me to do when he asked me to do it. And so I, I can't promise to be anywhere. I can't promise to be here right now. But I'll do my best. And I'll let you know. Because if God says go this way, I'm going to go that way. Amen? I'm not asking you to make better promises. I'm asking you to be careful about them. But I'm really couching that in this. There's a problem at those football stadiums now. Because some of those people standing on some of those corners are selling tickets to the game. And once you pay your $100 a seat for those 50-yard line seats that you promised, they're right there, look, I can, let me show you. My favorite is they say, let me show you a diagram of where they are. Does it teleport me there? Then what good does the diagram do? You sold those same two seats to 96 different people. A diagram doesn't help. Would it show them stacked up? How does it work? Right? You guys are familiar with this practice. You're looking at me like you've never heard of scalpers lying. I don't know if you know this, but fake tickets aren't worth very much. Well, I mean, they're worth something to the guy who made them and sold them to a sucker like you, but not to us. But that's what it's like. Here's a promise to get in, but you can't. That's the world. The world says you don't need Jesus. You don't need salvation. I promise. I promise my science is smarter than your God. I promise my reason is grander than your God. I promise you won't miss him at all. I promise you a better life. I promise it'll last. There was a series of drugs in the 80s and 90s, 2000s, and I'm sure next decade there will be as well, that promised weight loss. Just take this and you'll lose weight. I don't know if you know how your body works, but let me warn you that there's not a secret button that the pills hit that you didn't know existed. Your body wasn't waiting on that. Oh, you should have said that earlier. There's 30 pounds gone. There is no healthy way for your body to get rid of weight that fast. Can we nod our heads? As much as it hurts everyone's feelings, there's only one way to do it the right way, and that is exercise more and eat less. It's math. If the caloric intake exceeds the caloric burn, you will gain weight. Now somebody's like, I can eat all I want to. We don't want to talk to you. <laughs> this doesn't concern you. <laughs> this concerns those of us who are well-grounded. 
I don't know if I've ever shared my personal philosophy on correct weight, but I believe that I'm bound by gravity to maintain my weight because I neither sink nor float. <laughs> Amen? I gain a little, I don't know what will happen. I lose a little, I might just float right off. Because of my concern for all of you, I'm just going to I'm just going to maintain the pills promised weight loss. If you take this, you'll lose weight. It'll be great. What they didn't promise was that it's going to cost you a heart valve to do so. It's going to cost you a liver. Most of us have grown up enough to realize that if you take a medicine for your headache, promises to make your headache go away, but the side effects may include a list of things that make you wish you had a headache. Right? Right? Like, they always slide in the end, or possibility of death. Could you back up? Because I've had a headache, but I don't know if I've ever had one like that before. Yeah, it's worth it. Let's try it. See how it goes. It turns out all the magic pills and promises are empty and void and worthless. Amen? I don't need a promise founded in doctors. I cannot tell you. I wish we had time. I could walk through the history of it. But can I just explain to you that these scientists in whom we put so much stock change their mind more often than a Democrat in the South. I mean, I, meant, I didn't mean a Democrat in the South. I meant, that's not what I meant at all. I meant a politician in the South, I'm sure. It's just sort of, sorry. I promise I didn't mean that. Changes their mind more often than a politician. How about that? That's what I meant to say. My dad told me that. He said, you know how you can tell a politician is lying, right? Yeah, their mouth's moving. That's right. Scientists change their mind really often. We get a hard time because the church said that the earth was flat. Did you know that the Bible never said the earth was flat? The Bible's been a round earth Bible the whole time. Isn't that weird? It's almost like the creator knew. <gasps> Isn't that weird? We get a hard time because we're, we're told that the church believes in all these crazy things. Listen, I don't mean to hurt your feelings. I'm not that concerned with what the church believes. I want to know what the word of God says. Because the church is made of people and people are wrong all the time. But scientists change what they believe all the time. I mean, I've shared this with you before, but they said sugar is horrible. You need to get rid of sugar. You need to do sweet and low. Oh, you can't take sweet and low. I see shrinky faces. Don't do sweet and low. You should take equal because equal is all better and it's totally healthy. Oh, I'm sorry. Not that one either. You should take, what's the one of the day? Splenda because, yeah, I'm sure it's perfectly safe and fine. And then it turns out, you know what they're going to say to you? Hey, stick with sugar. It turns out your body, y'all may or may not know this, but your body was actually designed to take care of sugar. Now, is there a limit on how much you should take? Duh. But it's like people who try and convince me that I, I'm on a no-sodium diet. I hope not because you will die. Your body requires sodium to stay alive. You might say I need to reduce sodium. That's probably okay. But please don't get rid of it. Your body will go into bad things. Half of us in this room are taking medicine to make our sugar processes work better. Half of us in this room are taking medicine to make our sugar processes work worse. Because we overdo it or underdo it. There's hypothyroidism, thyroidism, and hyperthyroidism. Too fast or too slow. It turns out our body's just a heaping mess. But all the scientists change their mind about every decade about what you should or shouldn't do. Always do this. No, wait, never do that. What should I do? But because they're wearing a lab coat and they have cool glasses, we're like, well, the doctor says so. Have you ever wondered why four out of five doctors recommend stuff? Four out of five, really? If this is true, why wouldn't five of them recommend it? There's one old doctor who's like, I'm not falling for this again. I am tired of promises that are grounded on men. Because I love, there's a lot of great people out there, I, I love a bunch of them, but let me explain to you. Every person you believe in will let you down at some point. 
Many of them will hurt you. Some of them will crush you and alienate you. But God will never, ever let you down. Amen? Never let you down. Now let me make my circle full around here. God was at Bethel when Abraham got there, when Abram got back there. But listen to me. Abram drug God with him wherever he went. God didn't leave him to his own devices. But when Abram got his life back on track, he had to go back to where he left God. God was like, dude, I called it the house of God. Focus with me. But that's who we are. I think all churches ought to have their votes randomly without any announcement on Wednesday nights or Sunday evenings, whichever your church prefers. Don't tell anybody. Why does it matter? If it's a big deal, just show up all the time in case we have a vote. Weird, huh? Well, I just think that's not proper parliamentary procedure. Right. Like which parliament in the world is working correctly? Which speedy government are we going to follow for their efficiency? Right? You guys know that we have bills in the Senate that everyone agrees on that get passed almost unanimously, unanimously that go to the House and just die right there? And we have laws that are passed in the House that get recommended to the Senate on almost a full majority vote, and the Senate never even considers them? Yes, bicameral legislature. Let's stick with that. Let's tell everyone what we're going to do. What if you had to actually know what you're talking about to vote? That would be fun. Wouldn't that be cool? Here's a questionnaire before you walk in. What is this bill about? I don't know. You don't get to come in. I'm getting carried away, I know. I just want to make sure you understand that the world has been wrong all the time. And they're only right when they agree with God. It's the only time. The unchangeable truths of the word of God. So even though God might evoke change in our church if we surrender to him, it's really not change. He's more like saying, hey, y'all changed. I stayed the same. Come back to me. Well, you know, God doesn't bless music unless it's just like the kind I like. Oh, that sounds reasonable. Good point. I think God likes music that glorifies him. I don't actually think that. I know it. I just, it sounds softer to say, I think. I know that the only thing that matters to God is, is he glorified in it? I don't care if at the end of the sermon, y'all are all throwing your wallets at the altar, and you're all hooting and hollering, and you're throwing gold coins, and you're holding up lighters, and you're saying that's the greatest message ever known to mankind. If it didn't glorify God, then it was a giant waste of time. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to have to stand in front of God and give an accounting for it one day. The promise that I am offering you today isn't grounded on earthly means. It is not incumbent upon Abraham's faith. It is not incumbent upon your pastoral staff. It is not a matter of this church to decide. I was a pastor of a church one time that when people came to join the church, I would get in trouble because I know it sounds crazy. When people would want to come to join the church, I'd say, hey, Dylan has come to join the church today. What says the church? The church say, oh, we're in favor. Say, hey, hey, everybody opposed. Meet me at the altar. Right? Right? And they'd come, and we'd done. And I'd say, hey, and I'd welcome to the church. And, and I had a deacon pull me aside. You, uh, <clears throat> you can't do that. Oh, really? Okay, why? Well, you have to offer them the, the, the right hand of church, say it, fellowship, until it's been, you know, vetted, and we did a background check, and we did a financial whatever, and then they, we've checked them out, and we asked their grandma and their grandpa and everybody else, and then, and then after in conference, we'll have a big get-to, and we'll have a vote on whether they can be in our church, and if we vote that they can be, then we'll give them the right hand of church membership. I said, I only have one right hand. That's all I was burned with. I don't have two. You know what they were saying? This is our church, Pastor, and we'd like to have a say in who can be in here and who's not. 
okay, awesome, I don't care. Because I don't care if they ever join your little commune. I don't care if they fluff up your cult. Because there's only one thing that matters. When they stand in front of God, they're not going to ask what church you went to. If they've received Christ as their personal Savior and been baptized by immersion as a sign of their salvation, then what on earth are you waiting for? Well, they might be one of those people. Good. I'm glad God brought a sick person to the hospital. Their one vote. What are they going to do? They might vote you out. Bring it on. If that's the majority, I'm gone. No problem. But goodness gracious, what are we worried about? Well, that's just not how we do things in my church. And the fact that you call it your church is the whole problem. Now, I'm certainly not speaking of this great church, but y'all probably know some churches to which this would apply. And my question is simply this. Where is the promise to be found? It's not this church, folks. If you don't get a card, they get stapled to your heart. You show it to Jesus when you get to the gates. Amen? You don't get a membership card that says, the high church of who's it's and what's it said I'm in. Doesn't matter. Amen? My, my papa used to say, all that and 10 cents would buy you a cup of coffee, but no one in this room remembers 10 cent coffee, I'm sure. <laughs> 10 cents? What was that? What was that in the 1850s? Yeah, probably. We live in an age when people would pay $5 for coffee and think, that was a great deal. Right? Some of you would pay $5. Some of you paid $9 this morning for your super frappy latte grande. <laughs> to which you reply, yes, and that's why we're still awake, Pastor, so you might want to <laughs> might want to watch it with the Starbucks jokes. <laughs> To which I said we'll be serving coffee for free, right? On that. <laughs> My question is this. Your life is founded on a promise. Either it's a promise that you have made against all the universe that you will secure your eternal soul yourself, that you will be eternally responsible for everything, or you have surrendered your heart and life to Jesus Christ and placed your promise on him. There is no middle ground in which you say, I got it under control. You are either saying, I hold the promise in my hand, and I commit that I will hold all of eternity in sway, and I will achieve immortality on my own, or you are trusting God for that. My question this morning is twofold. Number one, where is your promise being held? My son pointed out a meme the other day that was funny. It was a bag of 100 plastic pennies that cost $3.98. Yeah, that's right. You're doing the math in your head. 100 actual pennies would only be a dollar. So I could go get 100 pennies from the bank for $1, or I could get 100 plastic ones for $3.98. Hmm. I wonder why our economy is in trouble. Plastic money is worth more than real money. There was a time when that dollar bill in your pocket had a piece of gold associated with it. And it was a promise that this dollar, this paper was good. This fabric was good for something because you could cash it in for your gold at any point. It stood for something. But no more. Now it's an empty promise by a hopeless government. It's only concerned with themselves. Church, why is it that we want the world in our church when we know that the world is condemning itself already? Where is your promise grounded? What's backing up your promise? Is it your own ability, strength, virtue, or is it God? Second, if you have placed your faith in Christ. Are you letting it show? Are you surrendered to say, you know what, God? If I'm going to place my faith in you for eternity, 
I might want to go ahead and place my life in your hands right now. There's a strong difference between being saved and Jesus Christ being the Lord of your life. Big difference between the fire insurance and living as a Christian. I'll remind you that the term Christian wasn't a term they made about themselves. It was an accusation against them that they acted just like Christ. Wouldn't it be cool if we weren't allowed to call ourselves Christians, but we had to let other people do it? Mm Mm-hmm. That's what I said. Would people say it about you? People know that you love greater than you hate. You offer grace more than judgment. You stop the gossip and echo the praise and the prayers. Are you a source of hope and help for your coworkers, your neighbors, your family? I've got a family member that may not talk to me. But when they have a need, guess who they call? And you might say, that's terrible. And I say, I thank God for it. I thank God for it. I want to live a life that says, this is what I do. This is who I am. Is Christ alive in your heart today? If he is, then can you let it show? I'll ask the instrumentalists to come. We prepare our hearts and our minds for a time to just stand in front of the Almighty. We sang a great song of praise and tribute about that day that's coming. And I want to remind you that that promise isn't grounded in this church or any of these people. It's grounded in the word of God, which is eternal. The Bible promises about itself that not one I or one cross of a T is going to disappear. That one tiny bit of the word of God is going to come undone until all is revealed with him. We have a promise that our Savior will stand for us and with us and by us. If you're outside of the family of God, then you are among friends today. We want you to come in. I got all the tickets you can handle. All you've got to do is surrender. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sin separates me from God. I ask my Jesus to forgive me of my sin. Thank you for joining us today. We want you to know that you are always welcome at the summit. We are located on Highway 81 south of Loganville. Sunday school is at 9 a.m. and worship is at 10.30 a.m. For more information, you can visit our website at thesummitchurch.com.